A proposal for a giant new space telescope. A Venus-sized world in a star's habitable zone. Vera Rubin gets its camera and the first data release from Euclid. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. You know I like to keep my eyes on next generation telescopes, both on the ground and in space. And I was looking through Archive, which is the sort of place where astronomers post their scientific pre-journal releases. And there was a proposal for a new next generation space telescope called the Single Aperture Large Telescope for Universe Studies or SALTUS. And this will be a 14 meter off axis telescope for far infrared. And there's like a bunch of pieces here that are really exciting to me. So first 14 meters, that's big. Now, in the far infrared, the kinds of telescopes that operate in that area are like the Herschel telescope or Spitzer. And they are, you know, in the sort of meter to two meter class, 14 meters, so significantly bigger than any far infrared observatory that has ever been launched before off axis. So when you think about a telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, you've got the primary mirror, you've got the light coming into the primary mirror, it's bouncing off going to a secondary mirror, and then it's going out to wherever the camera systems are. And the secondary mirror has to hang directly in front of the primary mirror. And so it's blocking some of the light that is getting down into the primary mirror. With an off axis telescope, you've got the secondary mirror outside of the field of view of the primary mirror. And so the light comes into the primary mirror, it bounces sideways, goes to the secondary mirror, and then you're able to you know, have all of the instruments that are able to gather the scientific data from that. And so you don't have it obscuring your primary mirror. Now these are challenging to build, because you don't just have to do a spherical or some kind of parabolic mirror shape, you've got to come up with something that can take the light that's coming in directly, and then off axis it all to wherever you want to try and actually study it. It has been done before the large binocular telescope down here on Earth is an off axis mirror so that its secondary mirror isn't in the way of the primary instruments. And as I said, this is a far infrared proposal. So you're looking at between say 34 and 660 microns. And so what can you do in that area? Now, in infrared, invisible light, in ultraviolet stars are very hot, they're very bright. But in the far infrared stars actually don't give off a lot of far infrared illumination. And so they're relatively dim compared to the surrounding gas and dust. And so if you want to make observations of newly forming planetary systems, you want to be able to look at star forming regions in galaxies, you want to be able to look at really highly red shifted areas of the universe, stuff that is like near the very beginning of the universe, far infrared is the way to go. And it is this gap in our observing. I did an interview about six months ago about how we really need a far infrared telescope. It's this missing piece. And hopefully, this Saltus telescope will fill in that slot. So could be that one of the next generation telescopes that we see is a giant far infrared observatory taking the observations from James Webb to the next level. A new Venus sized world found in the habitable zone. NASA's test mission has turned up a new really intriguing world that I think is going to satisfy a lot of our exoplanetary requirements. The planet is called Gliese 12 b and it's orbiting a red dwarf star that's about 40 light years away. So very close compared to a lot of the other exoplanets that have been found with tests. The planet is estimated to be right in between the size of Earth and Venus. So it's like a super Venus, it's a mini Earth. Um, and like Venus and Earth are roughly the same size. Anyway, the planet orbits its star so close that it's receiving about 85% of the radiation that Venus receives from the sun. So it's going to be a little cooler than Venus surface temperatures will be a little more moderate. And that puts it within the sort of inner side of the habitable zone of the star. So Gliese 12 b is about 40 light years away from Earth, which is about the same distance to the Trappist one system. So you've got these just two examples of places where you've got planets that are roughly Earth sized, that are orbiting a red dwarf star, and you've got like another chance to check for an atmosphere. So 
I think this is the first we've heard of this exoplanet, but it definitely won't be the last. Now, I'm going to talk more about Venus as an exoplanet that we have right here in the solar system at the end of this episode. So stick around for that. The largest planet forming disk ever seen. All right, now check out this picture. This for a while was a mystery. It's kind of a butterfly shaped tiny little nebula. And now astronomers think they know what it is. And it's pretty exciting. So this is a planet forming disk. So this is a young hot protostar that's surrounded by a planet forming disk. We're seeing it close to edge on we're seeing sort of a side view of the system. And what sets this apart is that it is absolutely gigantic. So astronomers use the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, and they were able to analyze the structure of this planet forming disk. And they found that it is so big. In fact, consider the distance from the Earth to Jupiter, if you go 300 times that distance away from the star, you have still got enough material in the disk to be forming giant planets like Saturn and Jupiter. And so we've never seen anything that is this big before. It's like imagine how many giant planets could be forming around this protostar if it's got that much material and those kinds of distances involved. Voyager one is back. All right, just want to give you a quick update on Voyager one. Of course, NASA lost communication with Voyager one last year when it was sending home gibberish. And they realized that there was a problem with one of its computers, probably a cosmic ray, they were able to take the parts of the damaged memory and able to split it apart into other components inside the Voyager one computer, and they were able to then restore communications with it. So now they're back in business, they're receiving regular science data from two of its science instruments, since the glitch happened. And keep in mind, Voyager one launched in 1977, it is 24 billion kilometers away that the signals take 22 and a half hours to go from Voyager to Earth, and then the same to go back. And so we are still communicating with this spacecraft that is this old and yet it's still continuing on out into interstellar space. The Chinese space station just got a new aquarium. China just launched its Shenzhou 18 mission to the Chinese space station. And this brought a fresh crew of Taikonauts, that's the Chinese version for astronauts, as well as a bunch of cargo and supplies and science experiments. And one of the things that they brought was a little aquarium with four zebrafish. And when they brought the zebrafish on board the space station in weightlessness, the fish were perplexed. And so they've got this really cool video showing the zebrafish moving around. And according to the Taikonauts, the fish were swimming upside down, they were spinning sort of, I guess, doing barrel rolls, uh, and swimming in little circles. And then after about three weeks, they settled down reoriented to their new weightless environment and seem to be thriving at this point. The reason they brought the fish to the station is they're trying to examine can you build a closed ecosystem in a space environment, you're probably familiar with biosphere two, which was this experiment in the US where they put a bunch of people into an enclosed ecosystem and tried to let the thing operate it didn't quite work that great they ran out of oxygen and they needed to replenish it. Well, a very similar experiment has actually been running in China on a much smaller scale, and arguably, I guess, successful. And so now they're wondering, can they take this closed environment where you've got plants, you've got animals, you've got humans trying to do science, and they're all interacting. And then can you make that work? in a space environment or maybe on a lunar station. And so sending zebrafish to space is the first step of this process. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space and astronomy news of the week. And the winner by a long shot last week was the amazing auroras that everybody saw around the world. I hope that a lot of you out there got a chance to see these auroras. I mean, they were available to quite far low latitudes. And so, um, you know, definitely, we saw them here, you saw the pictures from my wife last week. Uh, and I know a lot of people were sending in their pictures. So no surprise, congratulations to everybody who got a chance to see them. And this isn't your last chance, like, 
we are still approaching solar maximum. There will be more sunspots, more solar flares, more coronal mass ejections, and more auroras. So just keep your ear to the ground, to space, to the sun, and hopefully when the next one arrives, you'll be, get a chance to watch it. Now, we put up the vote onto our channel within about 24 hours of when we release this episode of Space Bites. So uh, just wait for that. We'll put it into the community tab. Of course, if you're just scrolling on your phone, you should see the vote pop up. Just give a second, give us a vote, tell us what you think. And of course, the best chance is if you subscribe to our channel. And if you've like watched a bunch of our videos recently, that will tell the YouTube algorithm that you want to be part of this community. More evidence for the gravitational wave background of the universe. So astronomers have been observing the gravitational waves from colliding black holes since 2015. There's the LIGO Observatory, and then that was joined by the Virgo Observatory and the Kagura Observatory. And now we know of like a new gravitational wave merger almost every week, thanks to these observatories. But another gravitational wave announcement that was made a little later than that was of the background gravitational waves of the entire universe. And these observations were made with what's called the pulsar timing array. So you've got these pulsars, these are dead stars that have recently gone supernova and you're left with just this rapidly rotating neutron star that is sending out beams of radio waves on an incredibly precise, predictable measure. They are turning hundreds of times a second, you measure as these beams are coming towards us, and you can detect slight oscillations as these pulsars are being shifted back and forth by these background waves. And it's believed that these background gravitational waves are coming from supermassive black holes that are spiraling inwards towards each other, they're getting closer and closer, and eventually they're going to merge. Right now, the current crop of gravitational wave observatories can't detect those merging supermassive black holes. They can only detect the smaller ones, the less massive ones. But thanks to the pulsar timing array, we know that these giant mergers are happening across the universe. This week, the European Pulsar Timing Array Association released their second data set. So this is an update on the observations that they made over the last few years. They get more evidence, more precision that these giant supermassive black hole mergers are happening, these inspiring supermassive black holes that are getting closer and closer to each other. But they're hoping that maybe they can find some other evidence for large scale structures in the universe, maybe detect the presence of cosmic strings, maybe find the remnants of inflation as it created these gravitational ripples in the universe, maybe be able to test out and put constraints on various theories of dark matter and dark energy. And so the work just continues. And what's great is it just it just keeps adding up year after year after year, they keep making these pulsar timing observations, they can just get more and more sigma for uh, some of these large scale predictions and give physicists a sense of where to build new instruments, what kind of phenomena to look for. Vera Rubin gets its camera. So a big date this week, the Vera Rubin Observatory received its giant camera. And so this is a pretty cool picture. I don't know if it's the orientation of the picture, but it looks like you just take off the lens cap and just attach this to your DSLR. And then you'd have this enormous lens attached to your camera. Think of the pictures you could take. But of course, this one is 3200 megapixels. It is the large astronomical camera that's ever been built. And it's going to be affixed to the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is going to see first light in 2025 and not 2015, like I said last time. Now, the camera was built in California, and it was flown to Chile in a Boeing 747 cargo plane, it landed at the closest airport to where the Vera Rubin Observatory is, they put it on a truck, and then they drove this grueling 35 kilometer journey from the airport to the observatory, it took them five hours. So what's that they were going seven kilometers an hour, like they were being very careful on this dirt road. But now they have the camera in hand at the observatory, they've coded the primary mirror, everything is coming together. First light Vera Rubin is almost upon us. A new data release from Euclid. Now, as always, I like to 
end the episode with cool new pictures. And these cool new pictures underlie some really interesting science that just happened. So the European Space Agency's Euclid mission launched a little less than a year ago. It is at the L2 Lagrange point joining Gaia and James Webb. And it is doing this large survey of the universe. It has two instruments. It's taking images in the visible light to be able to sort of see the shape of various galaxies. And then it's taking data in infrared light. It's using that to measure spectroscopic information about those galaxies. And then from this, astronomers will be able to map out in three dimensions all of the galaxies and galaxy clusters out to billions of light years away to get astronomers ready for what the future data is going to look like from Euclid, they released an early data set this week. And these are just a just a subset of the data, just a few million galaxies that they can use to sort of understand what the data format is going to look like, try to figure out how they're going to be able to incorporate these into their research. And of course, a lot of really cool objects were captured as they were gathering this first data. And so the folks at the European Space Agency released a series of all of these images and they're they're beautiful, you know, interesting nebula, colliding galaxies, things like that. And I think, you know, there were like 11 million galaxies in just this first data release. So they found the nicest ones and asked people to sort of pay attention to those. So definitely check out these new images from Euclid and just like be prepared. This is just a tiny fraction of the amount of data that's going to be coming from the Euclid mission over the coming years. You're watching Space Bites, and this is where we cover a handful of interesting space stories that broke this week. But this is just a fraction of all of the news we're covering at Universe Today. And so to incorporate all of that, I write a weekly email newsletter that goes out every Friday. So while you're watching this, I am just putting the finishing touches on my newsletter. And if you hurry, you can sign up right now. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of stories that we're working on in the newsletter, what if we could use solar panels as a techno signature to find alien civilizations? Matter swirling around a black hole stop swirling and just falls straight in. And when Uranus and Neptune were migrating outward, three objects per hour were crashing into them. So those just an example of some of the stories that are going to be in the newsletter that you're not going to see on Space Bites. So go sign up for that. I write every word. It's completely free. There's no advertising at all. Universetoday.com slash newsletter. Now I want to talk about Venus as an exoplanet. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, David Gilton, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Modso, Paul Robach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Filer Munley, and Vlad Chiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. This discovery of Gliza 12b is really interesting. You know, you've got this world that is roughly the size of Venus. It's orbiting at roughly the same place as Venus is with respect to the amount of radiation that it's receiving. It's an exo Venus. And we're so lucky to have Venus here in the solar system. We've got this world that is roughly the same size as the Earth. It is closer to the sun than the Earth is. And yet it has just an utterly dramatically different environment. Hot enough to melt, I don't know, choose your metal, um, incredible atmospheric pressure, carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, but also just other gases in the atmosphere as well. It's very dry in terms of water vapor and hydrogen. How did Venus go so wrong? And so when we look out into the universe and we see various exoplanets that are roughly Earth sized worlds orbiting around sun like stars, we can tell. And so when we look out into the universe and we see other Earth sized worlds orbiting around sun like stars in the habitable zone, we know that there's a giant amount of variation that you can get Venus or you can get Earth and we need to be able to tell the difference. So I had an amazing interview with my friend Paul Byrne, who really brought me around to Venus being an exciting place, not just as just fascinating in its own right as a geological 
world, but also how it can teach us a lot about exoplanets. And as we think about our place in the universe, how will we be able to tell the difference between the Venuses and the Earth? So definitely check out that interview. All right, we'll see you next week.